Keeping venomous reptiles is an unforgiving hobby, requiring proper training and lots of experience. One simple mistake can be the difference between life and death. death, death. Remember, the most venomous snake in the world oh, is the whoa. one that just bit you. There are no venomous snakes with training wheels. Just because you see Viper Keeper handle snakes a certain way does not mean you should try it too. All right, so Miss Arutu, also fondly known as Miss, Miss Corkscrew, or the Misguided Missile, come on, open. Arutus are another South American lancehead in the genus Bothrops. Um, very potent hemorrhagic venom. Actually, there's one fatality here in the U.S. caused by one of these in a private keeper. So we will let her do her thing. Mr. Milos. Mr. Milos is Macrovipera Schweitzeri. He's from the Greek island Milos. That's the only place he's found. Not a very big viperid. You know, usually if it's in the genus Macrovipera, they get to be quite large, but the Milos viper doesn't get all that big. Um, which is fine. I mean, these are really cool species to keep, and uh, he's he's got a bit of personality. And gets the job done. They have your usual Macrovipera, large, large uh, viperid uh, group of snake venom metalloproteases in their venom, uh, whose primary function is the destruction of the ability to clot, as well as uh, local tissue destruction and necrosis. Um, He's quite personable, and uh, uh, we like him here. He's a, he's a nice, neat little snake to have. Of course, that said, we like to enjoy him from a safe position. Obviously nothing that uh, you want to get bit by, but uh, for having a very interesting little species of of snake, uh, he definitely fits that bill. He's not happy with us, of course, because you know he's about adult now, and we've cut back on his food. But this week he gets a he gets a nice uh, bit of food because next weekend he's not going to get anything and going to be very unhappy and. <laughs> Uh, sitting at the cage window on Saturday, waiting. Looking pathetic. Waiting for me to come by with the treats. I am the treat fairy for the snakes. Um, but that's not going to happen, so. I'll let Mr. Milos finish off his meal. Sure that we don't catch a snout or any part of the little mouse in <laughs> in the closing hinge there. Uh, he would be very very unhappy. Okay, so next up is uh, Miss Diporus here, Bothrops uh, Diporus or Bothrioides, as that group was renamed. Uh, uh, also known as uh, Mrs. Bobbitt. Uh, another large brown lancehead from South America. They all have 
pretty bad dispositions. They're pit vipers, so they can strike accurately at night. And if they miss, the pits will also help guide uh, the fangs uh, to a position where they could do their work. She's produced some babies for me, but you know I've had her since probably 2007, 2008. So she's she's getting up there, but she's a good old girl. Let's see if this blue Komodo is uh, interested. <laughs> yeah, some of these snakes, the only time we see them is when they pop their head out to grab a mouse. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, like Thumper here is a Trimosaurus uh, panisius. Uh, another Asian tree viper, and we almost never see them. We stick food in the doorway, and boof, there he goes. He <laughs> grabs it and disappears with it. Never saw a thing. <laughs> uh, yep, yep. So you can see him in, a, in the cage here. You can see his little face peering out of the hut there with the mouse in his mouth, and that's all we really see of him. Uh, you know, these snakes get terribly butt hurt if you disturb them, so uh, why do I want to disturb the snake and make it upset so it goes off feed and stress it? So I don't pull them out unless I have to clean the cage or, or something else, so we just don't see them. Yes, yeah, one of this this guy is a reluctant feeder. Uh, another blue Komodo. These are babies that were born here uh, in January 2017, to be exact. And you know, I'm sort of raising them up uh, and hope that I can uh, have some breeding pairs. Uh, so I have some captive-born and bred animals that zoos will accept. Uh, because the zoos cannot be absolutely certain where the adults came from. They could have been poached from the national park. We don't know that. However, they were legally exported by uh, the people in Indonesia. And they were legally imported by U.S. Fish and Wildlife with all the proper stamps and everything else. Uh, so they're here legally in the U.S. However, zoos, after many scandals, are very careful where they get their animals uh, from. A matter of fact, the Smithsonian Zoo in Washington, D.C., um, you have to know where the grandparents of a captive-born snake came from before they'll even consider it. I mean, uh, you know, a snake like Elvis, uh, whose lineage goes back three or four generations at the Kentucky Reptile Zoo, they may not even take him if he was for offer. So uh, they're very, very picky. Um, they usually only get their snakes from confiscations, and then I guess they, they waive the rules. Um, so. Uh, that's uh, that's the story with the Komodos. Now, <laughs> Mr. Barnetti here was in the back and saw me this morning and picked his head up and and poked it in there and said, "Ooh, it's feeding day. Would you like this, Mr. Barnetti?" Mr. Barnetti is another South American lance head, Bathrops Barnetti. Very lovely species. Uh, nice chocolate browns with with white highlights along the edges, uh, your typical Bothrops venom composition, uh, hemorrhagic, cytotoxic, um, you just don't want it under your skin, end of story. <laughs> but for a Bothrops, he's a 
pretty kicked back guy. He's uh, he's pretty relaxed. He's very shy. Doesn't really like to be bothered, but he's now uh, adjusted uh, to me and comes forward when it's feeding time, so I don't have to stick uh, the tool in the way back there. Uh, um, he has trampled and killed his poor <laughs> artificial plant there, but. Um, you know, I have to get some new plants anyway. That one's fairly old. <laughs> so, we can see Mr. Taipan is quite excited about eating. Uh, uh, and it's his turn. So, what we're going to do is... Uh, we're going to open the rodent's mouth, in this case a rat. And extend its tongue so it's easier for Mr. Taipan to find it. Now Mr. Taipan is very tricky uh, to feed because he's a Taipan and very excitable. Taipans, even though they've got, you know, very uh, good uh, sensory organs for finding prey, they're sight feeders. And you can't, if they're very excited, you can't move. You have to hold while the uh, animal is focused on the rat. Once it's struck, just like you saw, you drop the rat and you slowly withdraw. The faster you withdraw, the more attention you, uh, uh, you get from the snake and the snake will follow you out of the cage for, at a very high rate of speed and uh, it's a very frightening event. Uh, I've been chased across the uh, big room by Miss Taipan uh, um, and I've had Mr. Taipan come out and go from here to about here in less than a heartbeat uh, when uh, I, you know, got him distracted in a different direction and then stopped. So, sometimes I wish I had like six foot feeding tongs because they're just not long enough. So we're going to do Mr. Forrest Culver next. And this is a downsized uh, rat because he is well nourished and doesn't need such a large amount of food because he's not he may be active in his cage but he still doesn't uh, uh, burn a lot of calories oh there we go got, oh, you got it okay so um, at least he retracts uh, he's like give me that and get out of here I'm gonna eat this um, he's he's a good bloke as far as forest culvers go. I've had him since he was a hatchling. His mother was Ugandan and his father was South African. Uh, the parents came from the now closed and extinct Fitzsimmons Snake Park. Forest culvers were recently broken up into five species. Um, this one I am keeping the, the name, uh, the scientific name as Melanoleuca. Um, even though it's a hybrid, I don't know what to call it. Um, but uh, now there's five separate species of forest culver when there only used to be one. So. He's uh, struggling uh, uh, with his rat only because he can be a little inept, but looks like he's working his way to the pointy end of the rat. And once he does that, he will vacuum it down. Now, I'm going to try to pull that out before it disappears, but yeah, not too late. Too late. So people have become very alarmed that my snakes and other snakes getting substrate down their throat. Uh, aren't you going to take that off your snake? 
No, what do you think happens in the wild? They survive this. Uh, uh, you know, having some substrate and sticks and stuff get in their uh, uh, digestive tract. I've only had that bit, that was only an issue once with a small snake a newborn, we gotta shut this now because yeah, his, gonna come out of his mouth is unoccupied. But wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, there's gotta be more. Um, so, it was a juvenile snake that I was raising up and it got stuck and I could see that it was lodged uh, crossways in its gut. So I used this tool, pinned it, opened its mouth, went down almost its entire length, grabbed it by one end, pulled it out. No problem uh, thereafter. Snake uh, is still with me. What, dude? That should be plenty of calories for you. I know. You know, I really, they look at me like, oh, please, I'm starving. No, you're not starving, dude. Oh, I see Dad found his. Yep, yep. Again, he's a rat vacuum. Here we have the very excitable Mr. Brown. A pygmy mulga snake from Papua New Guinea. Now, in mainland Australia, where the normal mulga snakes are, if I can call them that, if you can imagine something very excitable uh, that looks like Mr. Brown, but is almost Elvis size, that is a snake to, uh, uh, to be very, very wary of. This is why they're called the King Browns also in Australia. They're huge. Uh, their venom, like your typical Australian snake, is a cocktail of different components, neurotoxins and cytotoxins. Uh, however, the mulga snakes are well known for having a large complement of myotoxins, which breaks down the muscles in your body and causes kidney failure because that released uh, myoglobin, which is what the muscles are made from, uh, gets liberated into your bloodstream and clogs the glomeruli in your kidney, uh, which is the filtering unit that filters your blood and creates urine. So, mulga snakes are a force to be reckoned with. It, they're quite toxic, very fast, and once they bite you, they generally don't let go. Now, he's another snake that it's relatively safe to have the door open as long as the mouth is occupied. Yes, yes. These guys, I need to replace their light bulb after everybody's fed in this stack. But they got fed last week. And, you know, even though they're looking hopeful and saying, hey, the guy is here that brings food and we smell it, um, they're going to be disappointed because they're not getting fed this week. Uh, they get fed every other week because they don't need it because they just sort of sit around. The elapids, who have higher metabolisms, get fed something every week, just about. Viperids get fed every other week uh, a moderate meal because they sit around most of the time. They're ambush predators. So uh, we're going to shut this right now and let Mr. Brown do his thing, and we're just going to move on. See how twitchy he is. He is. He is a very twitchy snake.